Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I am Council Member Inez Barron, and I have the pleasure, the distinction, and the honor of serving as the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. And before we start today's hearing, I just want to share a quote with you. As you know, this past January 15th would have been Martin Luther King's 90th birthday had he lived. So I want to share a quote with you from Dr. Martin Luther King. You may be 38 years old, as I happen to be, and one day some great opportunity stands before you and calls you to stand up for some great principle, some great issue, some great cause. And you refuse to do it because you are afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You are afraid that you will lose your job, or you are afraid that you will be criticized, or that you will lose your popularity, or you're afraid that somebody will stab you, or shoot you, or bomb your house. So you refuse to take a stand. Well, you may go on and live until you are 90, but you're just as dead at 38 as you would be at 90. And the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier depart death of the spirit, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Today we are holding an oversight hearing on pursuing a career in healthcare at the City University of New York. During the last legislative session, the committee held an oversight hearing on the status of nursing programs at CUNY in 2016, and an oversight hearing on the CUNY School of Medicine in 2017. There is a continuing shortage of skilled healthcare workers in the country, and projections on supply versus demand only worsen each year. According to the U.S. Census, in 2030, when all baby boomers are over the age of 65, older people will outnumber children for the first time in U.S. history. As the population ages and lives longer, accruing often complex conditions, some of which were once terminal and are now treatable for long term, the need for health care services will increase. Between the aging population and the Affordable Care Act, which is now bringing essential health care to millions of previously uninsured Americans, there is a great need for more family practitioners, general internists, pediatricians and obstetricians, gynecologists, as well as trained home health aides, nursing assistants, medical and clinical lab technologists, and medical and lab technicians in many communities across the country, state, and city. In New York State, the healthcare sector, which does not include healthcare workers employed outside the sector, such as nurses working in educational settings, or pharmacists working in set settings such as retail pharmacies or supermarkets, accounted for 12.3% of total employment in 2016, representing a nearly 30% increase or an additional 260,000 jobs between 2000 and 2016. During that same period, employment home health care increased by 183%, representing the largest increase in employment, while employment in ambulatory care settings increased by 37%. In New York City, employment in the healthcare sector grew by 37% between 2000 and 2016, while there was a 13% increase in employment. During that same period within the healthcare sector, employment increased by more than 35% in home health care, 1% in ambulatory care. While the state as a whole is not currently suffering from a shortage in the number of many types of skilled medical providers, they are poorly distributed, limiting access to care for underserved populations. As of December 2017, more than 5.8 million individuals resided in primary care health care professional shortage areas, 2.8 million in dental care, and more than 4.4 million in mental health. 
CUNY has been working to meet the challenges facing the healthcare industry, which, if not addressed in a holistic manner, threatens to become a crisis in New York City. But there is one critical facet of this challenge that I must address, and that is the blatant lack, uh, the, the overwhelming lack of people of color in the medical professions, particularly black doctors. According to the most recent data from the American S Association of Medical Colleges, only 5.7% of medical school's graduates were black or African Americans, despite constituting some 13.5% of our nation's population. And according to the Center for Disease Control, blacks are twice as likely to die from heart disease as whites. Blacks are also significantly more likely than whites to suffer from many other conditions, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, and other diseases that are more common at much older ages in whites than blacks. And yes, blacks are more likely to die from all health causes at earlier ages than whites. This is profoundly disturbing. There are many reasons why this may be the case, including discrimination, lack of access to primary medical care, or lack of insurance, among others. But research is beginning to reveal another reason why this may be the case, and that is the lack of black doctors. In 2008, a study by the National Bureau of Economics Research showed that black male patients were more likely to agree to preventative health measures after seeing a black doctor than seeing a white or Asian doctor. The study highlighted that the way in which white and Asian doctors interacted with their black patients played an important role in these outcomes. For instance, white and Asian doctors said similar clinical things to their patients, but tended to stand closer to their white patients, made more eye contact, and touched them more frequently all things that communicate empathy and concern. Black doctors, meanwhile, interacted empathetically with their black patients while using similar nonverbal cues to communicate empathy and the importance of preventative <laughs> follow-up care. In addition, a black patient who sees a physician of their race may be less guarded, more comfortable, and more relieved, even which further underscores the extent to which they may follow through with additional treatment and provider visits. Indeed, as one news article in the study suggested, the secret of keeping black men healthy may in fact be black doctors. CUNY has long been a champion of racial and ethnic diversity among its student body, and I want to applaud the important contributions it is making to address the underrepresentation of people of color in healthcare careers. Because I truly believe that this can contribution will help save many black lives as well as the lives of other underrepresented people of color. But I believe that we can do better. Indeed, we must do better because our lives are at stake and these lives matter. At this hearing, the committee is seeking an updated overview of CUNY's nursing programs and the School of Medicine as well as an overview of all healthcare programs at CUNY and how the university is preparing the workforce to meet the growing demands of the healthcare sector and occupations in healthcare outside of the sector. In particular, I'm, interest, I'm interested in learning about outreach and recruitment efforts of healthcare programs at CUNY, especially as they relate to the expansion of access to medical careers among underrepresented minorities. Additionally, we would like to hear about how CUNY is increasing necessary health care services in underserved areas of the city. I'd like to recognize the members of the committee who are present. We have Council Member Kalos, Council Member Rodriguez, and Council Member Holden. I'd also like to thank Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, M. Indigo Washington, my CUNY liaison and director of legislation, Chloe Rivera, the, community, the committee's policy analyst, and Paul Senegal, counsel to the committee, and Aisha Wright, the finance division unit head, who is temporarily standing in as the committee's finance analyst. And at this point, I'm going to have the council uh, call the first panel and um, ask them to take the oath. We have Jane Bowers, the Interim Executive Vice Chancellor of the University Provost of CUNY, 
We have Vincent Bodro, the president of City College of CUNY. We have President Marsha Keyes from York College of CUNY, and Jennifer Rabb, the president um, from Hunter College, my alma mater. Class of January 1967. Majored in physiology, minor in psychology. Uh, and the council will administer the oath. Good morning. Uh, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Thank you. Can you please restate your names for the record? Jane Bowers. Vince Boudreau. Mike Gleason. Jennifer Rabb. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. My name is Jane Bowers, as you've heard. I am the Interim Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost at the City University of New York. In this role, I serve as CUNY's Chief Academic Officer, responsi responsible for all of our academic programs, student affairs, faculty affairs, academic technology, libraries, and institutional research. As a sign of the importance CUNY gives to today's topic, I am joined by three college presidents, Jennifer Rabb of Hunter College, which offers CUNY's largest nursing program, Marcia Keyes of York College, whose unique nursing programs serve the diverse community in Southeast Queens, and Vincent Boudreau of the City College of New York, home of CUNY's medical school. They will each address the excellent educational opportunities at their institutions, and I will begin by giving an overview of health education at the university. Arguably, the quality of health care depends on the skills and education of the health workforce. To a substantial extent, health care in New York City depends on CUNY and its graduates. CUNY is committed to providing high-quality academic programs to prepare a pipeline of culturally diverse students to fill critical roles in healthcare. About 10% of all of our undergraduate students and 10% of graduate students at CUNY are pursuing degrees in health and human services fields. In academic year 2017-2018, more than 5,100 students, 2,300 associate and 2,800 baccalaureate graduated with degrees in health-related fields, 1,300 of them in nursing. At the graduate level, another 1,500 students earned master's or doctoral degrees in the same year. In 2017, CUNY graduates comprised more than a third of all newly licensed RNs in New York City. We offer more than 150 undergraduate and graduate certificate and degree programs in health and human services areas, including nursing and allied health. We are justly proud of the academic quality <coughs> of our health programs. Excuse me. In 2017, the combined CUNY pass rate on the NCLEX, the state licensing exam for nurses, was 86%, higher than the combined NCLEX pass rate of 83% for all other New York City-based nursing programs. Likewise, New York City the College of Technology's first-time licensure rate in dental hygiene is consistently 95% or better. Most of this education is offered in person on our campuses, but through the CUNY School of Professional Studies, we also offer online BS and MS programs in nursing and other health-related fields, such as health information management and nursing education. CUNY also offers more than 50 non-degree adult and continuing education programs for the healthcare workforce. These programs provide opportunities for non-traditional students to prepare for emerging careers in the healthcare sector. New programs include the state's first credit-bearing certified recovery peer program developed in response to the opioid epidemic. A community health worker apprenticeship program created for 1199 and Bronx Lebanon Hospital. And a health coach program for community care of Brooklyn. We have invested significantly in healthcare education in recent years, launching the Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy in 2015 and C the CUNY School of Medicine in 2016. We are also in the process of searching for a new University Dean of Health and Human Services who will provide academic leadership and coordinate cross-campus initiatives for the CUNY colleges and graduate schools that offer health education. 
of critical importance, the dean will network with employers to increase clinical opportunities for students. Currently, there are insufficient clinical placements to meet student demand, and this shortfall limits the number of otherwise qualified students we can admit to certain health majors, particularly nursing. CUNY nursing graduates come from diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds. Nearly 64% of our associate degree graduates are people of color, as are more than 70% of our bachelor's degree graduates. A majority of undergraduate nursing students who attain a degree are foreign born. CUNY's nursing students are often residents of the same urban neighborhoods as the patients they ultimately serve. Many of our health programs are equally diverse. For example, <coughs> City Tech runs the largest dental hygiene program in the region and graduates graduate significant numbers of underrepresented students in a field that has limited minority representation. Graduation from a CUNY health-related program provides aspiring students with a road to the middle class through employment in a respected profession. Jobs in the healthcare field represent about 12% of all jobs in New York State, and many of the fastest growing occupations are in the healthcare industry. The New York State Department of Labor expects that the state economy will add almost 125,000 healthcare jobs between 2016 and 2026, a growth rate of 21%. According to a data match between CUNY and the New York State Department of Labor, students who earn associate degrees in nursing or allied health fields such as radiologic technology typically earn salaries that range from $60,000 to the mid-70,000s, three years after graduation. With a bachelor's degree, CUNY-trained nurses and other health professionals typically make salaries from just over $60,000 to the low to mid-90s, three years after graduation. To be sure, students encounter financial challenges on the way to these careers, despite CUNY's affordable tuition. Financial aid may not cover the reduced course load many students must take in order to complete their challenging and time-consuming clinical classes. Students may pay out of pocket for required background checks or drug panels, for licensure prep courses, for the NCLEX licensing exam, and for the New York State license itself. To make it slightly easier to bear these costs, CUNY supports its health students by covering the costs of liability insurance for their clinical placements. We would like to do much more because investments made in these students benefit not only them, but also their families and New York City. CUNY must be prepared to navigate the dynamic and changing healthcare landscape by adapting its mix of program offerings, by securing sufficient clinical placement slots for our students, and by providing the necessary academic support to ensure that students can manage the appropriately rigorous health program curricula. Based on past experience, I am confident that we will rise to these challenge, challenges, and I thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Um, I would like to turn the mic, I guess, over <laughs> to uh, Vincent Boudreau, the president of City College, to speak a couple minutes. Thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you, members of the council, Chair Barron, for this opportunity to present the uh, CUNY School of Medicine. The recently accredited CUNY School of Medicine, built on the 45-year tradition of success at the Sophie Davis Biomedical Education Program, and it's determined to address the following critical challenges in healthcare and medical education. First, the limited number of physicians who seek to serve our underserved communities in areas of the greatest need, primary care. And second, the limited opportunity that is provided to young men and women from underserved communities, many of whom are underrepresented minorities, to successfully pursue a medical education. So we address these challenges in three ways. A unique seven-year program that recruits high school graduates from New York State who demonstrate an understanding and embrace of our social mission, the establishment of a comprehensive nurturing environment, and a curriculum that centers on the patient and focuses on increasing on creating compassion and caring physicians who appreciate, respect, and value diversity. So why the shift from the Sophie Davis program to the CUNY School of Medicine? In its old structure, the Sophie Davis program operated under a cooperating school model. During the first five years in this program, students completed a baccalaureate degree together with the didactic components of the first two years of traditional medical school. And I should say those first two years were at CUNY tuition rates. Students then transferred as third-year medical students to one of six cooperating medical schools to complete two years of clinical education and clerkships. 
Unfortunately, despite its extraordinary mission and outstanding record of accomplishment, our partner medical schools frequently placed greater emphasis on specialty practice areas over careers in primary care, and that diluted the potency of our students' commitment to primary care for the underserved. In addition, changes in medical education, expansion of class sizes in other medical schools, and the consumption of clerkship slots by offshore medical schools significantly reduced the capacity of clinical training for our students and made our earlier model obsolete. So in our new model, um, we are particularly concerned about the long-term financial viability of the educational program, and simultaneously, we are concerned about not being an additional burden on the state healthcare infrastructure. So we built a structure without ownership of a hospital, but with an affiliation agreement between the medical school and our clinical partners in New York State, in New York, hospitals and other health care facilities. The clinical faculty members are employees of and are paid directly by the hospital, significantly decreasing the potential financial obligations for the school. This affiliation model presents the greatest degree of separation between the medical school and the hospital and the least amount of risk and, and financial liability for our parent institutions, the City College of New York, CUNY, and the state for delivering the clinical components of medical education. So that's our, our model. Let me tell you who we are. Um, the CUNY School of Medicine, like Sophie Davis program, is committed to diversifying a profession that has often been insufficiently representative. We work in particular to make sure that patients in underserved communities have doctors and physicians assistants who are attuned to their needs. One way to do this is by recruiting medical students from the communities they will serve, students who are committed to providing health care to the underserved. With these goals in mind, our program has been a significant source of a diverse body of physicians working in New York's underserved communities, especially in primary care. And I'm going to start by talking about the Sophie Davis accomplishments, and then I'll talk about the CUNY School of Medicine. So, s over the 45-year history of Sophie Davis, 65% of their graduates practice medicine in New York, and that's the most of any medical school in the state. 41% of Sophie Davis graduates pursue careers in primary care medical specialty, and these figures place the Sophie Davis program among the top 10 medical schools in the United States in producing primary care physicians. If this trend continues with CUNY School of Medicine graduates, we will be the number one school providing primary health care physicians in New York State. 26% of Sophie Davis graduates are practicing in health professional shortage areas in New York State, and that compares to a state figure uh, of only 14% of physicians working in HPSAs. Over the course of the 45 years of the Sophie Davis program and now as the CUNY School of Medicine, 33% of its students have been from underrepresented minorities. Over the past 10 years, this number has increased to 42% of enrolled student, students. The transformation of the Sophie Davis program into the CUNY School of Medicine has not diminished our accomplishments in this area, quite the contrary. Over the past two years, 58% of our admitted students have been from underrepresented demographics, African Americans and Latinos. 63% um, of the students currently in attendance are from these same two groups. At the last meeting, fall 2017, of the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC, in Boston, our school was cited for being among the top five schools in the United States in terms of recruitment of African American students, preceded only by four medical schools in historically black colleges and universities, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, and Charles Drew. So I'd like to put these figures in the context of student recruitment at other medical schools nationally, represented as a percentage of national interest, uh, averages. The average percentage of African American students in medical school, so this is different from the graduate figure that you cited earlier, Chair, is 7%. At the CUNY School of Medicine, it's 39%. The average percentage of Latinos in medical school is 6.5% nationally. At the CUNY School of Medicine, it's 24%. We have more than the average number of women in school than the national average. The national average is 48%. We are 62% at the CUNY School of Medicine. And at the end of my uh, documents, there are charts uh, showing these figures in more detail. So let me now talk about faculty and administrative diversity. Um, although the CUNY School of Medicine is, a well, is well above diversity attainment figures for medical schools nationwide, this is an area where we have work to do. Um, it's been an issue that the students themselves have raised with the faculty, and in response to their input and concerns, 
that we further diversify our faculty, we now have students on every hiring committee. And they've long since served that role in recruitment committees, and that's one of the reasons why we've been able to recruit such a diverse group of students. The school is in the midst of a build-out process, and so we anticipate that this is one place at CCNY where we will be hiring in numbers in the near future, and that means that with some focus and concentration, there's a real chance to build on our diversity hires. But here are the, here are the figures. Nationally, medical school faculty are comprised 4.8% of Latino. Faculty members, 3% are African Americans. At the CUNY School of Medicine, 12.4% of our faculty are Latinos, 9% are African Americans. 60% of our faculty are women as compared to 39.5% nationwide. 25% of our department chairs come from underrepresented groups as compared to 12% nationwide. 25% of the school's deans and 29% of our senior administrative staff are either African American or Latino. So th these are numbers that compare well with national figures, but we are not satisfied with these numbers and we'll be working to increase them. So the CUNY School of Medicine passed its intermediate accreditation review last year. We'll graduate our first class of doctors in the spring of 2020. At this writing, the school is still assembling the instructional and administrative staff um, that it will need for the last two years. Um, people that will manage some of the more complicated elements of medical education, including clinical placements and rotations. Our research operation is just getting underway, and the fact that we have more hires to make gives us ample opportunity to strengthen our diversity figures for faculty administration. Still, we're excited to be able to serve the needs of our city and our state. The mission to provide more sensitive and effective primary health care in underserved communities and to diversify the medical profession by bringing the whole people into medical school is, in fact, a single, united mission. We look forward to serving this mission for our city, for our state, and for our people. Thank you. President Pucho, I'm turning it over now to Pre Pre President Keyes of York College. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the Committee on Higher Education. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. You know who I am, Marcia Keyes, President of York College. As many of you are well aware, for over 50 years, York College has served as the ac academic nucleus of the diverse Southeast Queens community. Our students, many of them immigrants or children of immigrants, represent more than 100 different nations of origin, speaking almost as many different languages. Uh, I want to focus my testimony uh, this morning on our nursing program. And um, I just want to give you a little context of the college. Uh, our college is organized into three schools, the School of Arts and Sciences, the School of Business and Information Systems, and the School of Health Sciences and the Professions. The Department of Nursing, our nursing program, resides in the Health Sciences and Professional Program and delivers a two-pronged nursing program, uh, a long-standing baccalaureate in science, BS, RN to BS, and the generic uh, BS nursing program. Both are accredited by the Accreditation Commission for Education in Nursing and the New York State Department of, uh, of Professions. Uh, our current accreditation, um, which was granted in 2014, is a full eight-year ACN accreditation. Uh, at the present time as well, just so you know, in the borough of Queens, uh, York College is the sole CUNY college uh, uh, offering nursing programs at the baccalaureate level. We hope within the next two years or so uh, we are currently working on a master's at that, uh, 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 in nursing. That is not on board yet, but we are solidly um, providing at the baccalaureate level. Uh, in terms of the kind of results we have in our s students, um, our most recent result, the 2018 result, in terms of the NCLEX pass rate, it was 94% well above the New York State average of 87%. I want to talk a little bit about recruitment and, um, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me. Uh, let me just focus on the two nursing programs for a minute. Uh, there are two pathways. A long-standing, established in 1985, RN to BS. What this means is that students came to us at York holding the associate degree and being nurses, having passed the NCLEX <coughs> exam. And what we did at York was to complete them 
with the baccalaureate. That's the longstanding program established in 1985. In 2012, um, we uh, did a variation on that program where we established a dual joint admission between our community colleges and ourselves so that students who entered the community college would get seamless transfer into our baccalaureate program. So we have that variation going. The second program, the generic nursing program, is newer to York. It was established in 2011 and reflects the college's commitment to the 2010 Institute of Medicine report, The Future of Nursing, Leading Change, Advancing Health, and recognize the need in Queens and in New York City to increase the total number of baccalaureate prepared nurses entering the workforce. York's first cohort of generic BS students graduated in 2013, and we've had a total of 137 students graduate from that program since 2013. Our recruitment efforts start in our at Office of Admissions where it is centered on what they describe as an inside Queens, outside Queens approach. We focus first on our Queens population and we also focus on the other boroughs sometimes. Um, sorry, President Rob, <laughs> but we do try to come into Manhattan sometimes and into Bronx and maybe even to Brooklyn. But we do try to focus on the Queens inside out as, as they say. The majority of our new first time student applications come from Queens, followed by Brooklyn, and then from the other boroughs. Uh, the majority of the high school visits is focused on Queens to maximize those relationships. Uh, as I said, then there is a broadening out as well so that we work with our sister community colleges to work to, to lock in seamless transfer from the community colleges to York. The current status of our program. And I want to focus on the generic since it's really our larger, larger program. Uh, we currently have 130 generic nursing students and 22 RN to BSN. The ethnicity of the students in the generic programs is 30% black, 49% Asian or Pacific Islander, 11% Hispanic, 9% white, uh, etc. Our department is really transforming the education of our nursing students through the use of simulations, uh, simulations in our state-of-the-art simulation lab. Students are prepared to meet the complex needs of patients in the current healthcare system and to function in the role as future nurse leaders. Our students uh, learn to collaborate and to lead by example by our faculty where seven out of the eight full-time faculty hold PhD degrees, and I must tell you, Chair Barron and your colleagues, this is not an easy thing to recruit and to maintain these faculty. They have many opportunities elsewhere, uh, and it's a constant struggle, quite frankly, because sometimes they're recruited away. But right now, we do have seven PhD trained, and our last a uh, faculty member who does not have a PhD is pursuing a PhD at the graduate school. Our faculty guide our students through research and pro to pro professional con conferences. It's a very core element of what we do because we really want to create nursing leaders. A core value for us at York is community engagement and experiential learning. And naturally, students in the nursing program not only get this through through their clinical training, but they get this through other collaborations, and I just want to cite one. Uh, since 2013, our nurses, led by Dr. Alexandra, our students have participated in summer two-week, three-credit course in Haiti, where your college students work alongside healthcare professionals in a service learning experience. And that experience is really something that is transformative for our students. Currently, we're also working with the Joseph Adabo um, Healthcare Center, where we expect to place uh, some eight or so um, already trained nurses to work in that center. 
what we are looking to for the future is to expand our program, quite frankly. But it is going to take some resources to uh, uh, nurses at the PhD level have many opportunities, although they're very committed to teaching and research. And we would like to see our program expanded because we believe we can serve a broader population in Queens. That would mean additional resources. Further, the other thing we are very committed to is for our graduates to pursue the masters and then ultimately the doctorate. Uh, like the model that exists at Hunter, for instance, or at the College of Sa Staten Island. Um, we have in our own nursing department the kind of individual who can propel that. Dr. Valerie Taylor Hazlip, I believe last time you had a hearing, she was here. She's the chair of our nursing program. She obtained her undergraduate degree from an HBCU, but later on she came back to CUNY. She got her master's at Lehman and her PhD at the Graduate Center. She moved into the ranks of teaching at the associate degree level and she now chairs our department and leads it. Our students are encouraged to model that kind of professional trajectory. Our master's program, which we expect to launch in 2020, will help us on that journey. And down the road, as I mentioned, we hope to be able to model what Hunter has and what the College of Staten Island has in the DNP, the Doctorate of Nursing. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony today. Thank you, President Keyes and President Rao. Would you like to speak now? Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee of the City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you regarding the status of nursing and some other healthcare related programs at Hunter College. I am Jennifer Rabb, president of Hunter College, which has played and continues to play a vital role in preparing skilled healthcare workforce to serve New York City. It has been one of our strategic goals to recruit a diverse student body with an emphasis on underrepresented minority groups in order to diversify the future workforce, enhance their cultural competence, and address the comprehensive healthcare needs of New Yorkers. The Hunter College School of Nursing is the oldest and largest school of nursing within the CUNY system. We have been preparing nurses for practice in urban environments with diverse populations for more than 60 years. Our programs range from bachelor's degrees in nursing to doctorate in nursing practice. This reflects our commitment to preparing practitioners from entry level positions to highly spe specialized practice and leaders in positions in nursing. The school offers four undergraduate programs. The first is our Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, which my colleague Dr. Keyes referred to as our generic program, admitting students who come to us um, as undergraduates in their second year of study. We recently created a small but very focused honors program that attracts high school seniors who have a commitment and a passion for nursing. We recruit a cohort of between 20 to 25 students in their freshman year. They are given special scholarships and special mentoring with a focus on creating nurse leaders for New York. Our third program is an RN to BS program for individuals with associate's degrees, which is also pr uh, mentioned by my colleague, Dr. Keyes. These programs are particularly important in the senior colleges because the study that Dr. Keyes referenced from 2010 done by my predecessor, uh, Dr. Donna Shalala, really reinforced the fact that associate level trained nurses, nurses with just the RN and not the bachelor's degree are not going to be hired for most healthcare jobs in this country in the coming years. You're seeing a decrease in their hiring. So it is incumbent upon all of the CUNY schools, and I think we're all very committed to creating these pipelines from the community colleges to, so that these nurses can get their bachelor's degree and succeed in the jobs, particularly in the hospitals in New York. Our fourth undergraduate degree is also something that focuses on both increasing diversity but also the workforce shortage of nurses and it's an accelerated second degree nursing program which is designed to attract undergraduates who did, have not received a nursing degree and get them the prerequisites, get them their nursing degree and then get them on a fast track to a master's. So it's another focus to increase the number of nurses that we're graduating. 
we have renowned master's program offering a number of specialties, including the adult gerontology clinical nurse specialist, a community public health nursing practice, and our psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. We're also working on new programs in palliative care and, and cancer care, as well as other specialties. And finally, um, a number of years ago, Hunter created the first doctor of nursing practice program um, at Hunter College in which we prepare nurses for leadership positions within the healthcare system and has become a very popular program on, an un on a full-time and a part-time basis to move nurses from positions of care to real positions of leadership in our facilities in New York. Hunter is also actively and continues to be substantially engaged in the creation of new PhD nurses at the CUNY Graduate Center. All of our programs are fully accredited by the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, and the pass rate for our graduates on the NYCLEX nursing exam was over 91% in 2018. We are currently investing um, private philanthropy in supporting our students in preparation for this critical test. In recognition of Hunter's contributions to the field of nursing, Hunter recently received the 2018 Nursing Champion Award from the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation. The Hunter School of Nursing has a diverse student population with a commitment to always increasing these numbers. We have over 17% African American students, 10% Hispanic students, and 33% Asian students in our combined programs. Our master's and doctoral programs are even more diverse with 23% African American students in our master's program and almost 10% Hispanic students, and 35% African American students in our doctoral programs with almost 7% Latino students. We are also very proud of the fact that 97% of our nursing graduates work in New York City after graduation. Our efforts to include and to increase student diversity include strategic and coordinated efforts to create seamless pipelines from students graduating from high school and with associate's degree in nursing, including RNs, to get them graduate and undergraduate degrees in nursing, as I mentioned. Our School of Nursing has been working consistently with high schools, community college, New York City Hospital, healthcare facilities, and the local government agency to recruit students with high school diplomas or RN to pursue education on our bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels. We're also striving to support and retain our students once they come to Hunter, which is another very important indication and support for student success. We are proud that our attrition rate in 2018 for our nursing bachelor's program was barely 2.5%, and for our master's program was 1%. Good numbers leading success. One example of our innovative efforts at creating pipelines to nursing education at Hunter was the renowned BEST program, which stands for Becoming Excellent Students in Transition to Nursing. This is a program begun in 2004, supported by the federal government up to 2016, and it created opportunities for individuals from educationally and economically disadvantaged backgrounds, and in particularly recruiting high school students in which we were allowed to provide student stipends, scholarships, tutoring, special counseling, and opportunities for mentorship. This BEST program provides a great model for all of us going forward in recruiting underrepresented students into the field of nursing. Another example of our best practice methods is a partnership we have forged with Community College. In 2011, we established a special collaboration with Queensborough Community College to recruit their RN students into our Bachelors of Nursing program. We have now expanded that successful collaboration to LaGuardia Community College and have secured a $300,000 grant from the Petrie Foundation to help finance this pipeline. We hope to expand this initiative to include Borough Manhattan Community College in the future. I should note, though, that while focusing on recruiting is very important, one of the issues in nursing education is actually the great demand for students to become nurses. So we estimate that it's really anecdotal, but listening to our students and looking at their survey response, that about 10% of our incoming freshman class has their heart set on being a nurse, and about 20% of our transfer students. So the interest is there, it's about support, it's about capacity, and training, because the qualifications to be accepted into nursing programs are extremely rigorous, 
And that training is to start early to support their knowledge and their learning and success in basic science classes. In addition to our extensive nursing programs, Hunter offers several undergraduate and graduate programs in other health-related disciplines. We are proud to highlight our medical lab science program, which prepares students for advanced practice in hospital and private diagnostic labs, academic research laboratories, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. The program has been quite successful in attracting students from underrepresented populations, and currently tw almost 27% of the undergraduate students and 20% of our graduate students in this progr program identify as African American or Hispanic. With respect to our other healthcare related programs, over 14% of students in nutrition and food science, almost 13% of the graduate students in our doctorate of physical therapy program, and almost 10% of the graduate students in speech language pathology identify as African American or Hispanic. In my tenure as president of Hunter College, I am proud to have raised $15.5 million from various foundation, trusts, individual donors, and alums to support our School of Nursing program. In fiscal year 2019, nearly $320,000 in scholarships have been awarded to nursing students, with additional private funds being used to recruit and retain high achieving faculty and nationally renowned researchers. At Hunter College, we are not only committed to increasing student diversity, but faculty representation as well. We know that diverse faculty not only benefit Hunter College through their teaching, scholarship, and service, but also serve as role models for our students. Among the 23 tenure track and tenured faculty in nursing, nearly 9% identify as African American or Hispanic. We have extended this commitment to diversity to our adjunct faculty. 42% of our adjunct faculty identify as members of underrepresented groups, with 27% of our adjunct faculty who identify as African American and 15% who identify as Hispanic. As part of our commitment to increase faculty diversity, we recently submitted an RCMI grant, which stands for Research Centers and Minority Institutions, to NIH, and if funded, this grant will allow us to strengthen our efforts in recruiting African American and Hispanic scholars and researchers working in the healthcare field at Hunter College. At Hunter College, a critical part of our mission is to support the health and wellness of low-income, under-resourced communities in New York City through faculty and student engagement. This enhances our graduates' commitment to return and serve in these committees. And I'd like to speak about two of our recent focus on supporting communities um, in both East and West Harlem. In Hunter, Col Hunter College's commitment to East Harlem has been long-standing, and its importance was further cemented when we moved our Silverman School of Social Work to that neighborhood in 2011. Since then, Hunter has significantly expanded its engagement with the East Harlem community. For some examples include having 12 nursing students from our community nursing and pediatric nursing specializations placed in a local public school, PS7, to work with teachers on improving the students' health and health assessments and their hygiene skills. In collaboration with Weill Cornell's Clinical Translational Research Center, our nursing students teach CPR and opioid overdose prevention to community residents. They also provide cardiovascular risk screening and counseling to people in East Harlem through a partnership with Weill Cornell and Heart to Heart. One of our faculty members who is a resident of East Harlem, Dr. Judith Aponte, who is a Hunter alum and, and as I said, an East Harlem res resident, is a leading Latina pr pr practitioner, scholar, and researcher in the field of nursing with a focus on diabetes. She has collaborated with the Union Settling Association and senior centers in East Harlem to explore how technology may be utilized by older adults to help manage their diabetes. In West Harlem, our Rudin Professor of Nursing, Dr. Elizabeth Tong, is the co-founder of Communities of Health of Harlem Rev Health Revival, which is a faith-based and community-based organizations working together to improve the spiritual, physical, and mental health of Harlem residents. This project is a partnership with Reverend Calvin Bucks and the Abyssinian Baptist Church Health Ministry. Dr. Cohn is also the community engagement lead for the NIH-funded All of Us Research Program, which has enrolled 10,000 participants since May 2018, and 66 of which of whom are underrepresented in biomedical research. This program, many of you may have heard about in the movie made, where it was made famous in the story of Henrietta Lacks, and this is the NIH's program in Harlem in which we're deeply involved. 
And I'd love, um, Chair Barron, at some point to be able to talk about, referring to your earlier comments about dis health disparities and care. We have a major new grant that we're extremely excited about um, from the NIH. Um, it's a multi-million dollar grant over a number of years with Temple University to address health disparities, particularly in cancer and particularly in prostate cancer. And we'll be doing that on the eastern seaboard from Philadelphia to New York. And our professor um, who's received the grant is a major expert in the issue of health disparities, particularly in black men and prostate cancer. Um, I'd like to end by just talking about two students who inspire us to keep doing the work we're doing and as an indication of our commitment to the topic of today's hearing. Um, a recent graduate named, interestingly, Rachel Nurse Baker um, was a daughter of immigrants from Trinidad and Grenada who grew up in Bed-Stuy. She went to the Clara Barton High School showing early on a passion for nursing, but she had many obstacles in her way as an immigrant in an under-resourced family. But she made it to Hunter. We supported her education. She became the vice president of our student nursing association, and we're so proud today that she's at New York Presbyterian, New York Methodist Hospital, um, providing care and living her dream. Mariella Costanello, a 2017 graduate who is Latina, came to Hunter through the program I mentioned, the BEST program, where she was recruited as a high school student, again, to realize this passion. She worked with Dr. Judith Aponte as her mentor and who inspired her to consistently commit to nursing and is now an RN at Mount Sinai in the cardiovascular intensive care and is planning to come back to us for her graduate education to become a certified nurse anesthetist. These students and our commitment to nursing and healthcare education exemplify our Hunter College motto, Mihi Cura Fitori, the care of the future is mine. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you this morning about Hunter College's commitment to healthcare education in New York City. Thank you, President Rabbit. I'd like to thank these three wonderful presidents uh, for their leadership in healthcare education in our CUNY colleges. And um, we are happy to answer any questions you might have, Chair Barron or members of the committee. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that was quite a bit of information. Get some feedback on my mic. That was quite a bit of information. Uh, very inspiring and quite pleasing to know of the accomplishments that CUNY has, is standing on and is looking to expand going into the future. I want to commend you for the presentation, which cites the great work that you're doing in your individual schools and throughout CUNY as a whole. And uh, do just have some questions. Can you tell me a little bit about CUNY's consortium of nursing programs and how, who is a part of that? Is that open to all of the CUNY schools? How do they meet um, and what do they do? How, what's the relationship to hospitals? We do have a nursing council, I assume that's what you're referring to, which is the nursing deans from all of the nursing programs in CUNY, and they do meet regularly. Um, right now, of course, without a, a dean at CUNY Central um, in this interim period, um, we, uh, we still continue to have the nursing council meet, but not um, uh, with a dean at the head, which will be helpful when that happens because their, their activities will be better organized and move forward. Um, and uh, I assume that that is the, what you're referring to, but if there's something else that's a consortial arrangement well, that you know of that. Well, since you're talking about that, we'll just yeah. follow that, okay. that organization. You're talking about the I, nursing I council? I would just also add that I think there's, there's we spoke, Dr. Keating and I were speaking about because of this need for real seamless transfer from the CUNY colleges to the senior colleges, and because these students really, it's our responsibility to ensure they get this bachelor's degree so they'll be able to continue to practice their chosen field. We all speak with each other very mm -hmm. regularly, mm -hmm. and we have, all of us have some very specific programs to make sure that we, we're working on these pipelines. So I think it's one place yeah. where we really do communicate. Yes, yeah, so CUNY, CUNY is very, um, uh, aggressive in, in, in developing these two plus two programs in key educational areas and and health education nursing being being the absolute 
most important uh, in my view. And um, they're, they're really wonderful for students because it is, the transfer is seamless. You, you don't have to apply as long as you follow the path in the community college. Um, and the curriculum has been developed jointly by the community college faculty and the senior college faculty. So it really is just a seamless flow and creates many opportunities for students and also opportunities for collaboration among the college. When you say two plus two, you're talking about the associates? Then Associate okay. to baccalaureate, yes. Okay. Yes, and the, it's two plus two because it's guaranteed. You do your two years and, and, and do well and get your associate, and then you just move over to the bachelor's degree where there's, where there's this um, agreement arrangement. Can you give me some information? I know it's quite select and uh, very uh, demanding program to get into the nursing mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. And DOE talks about their great improvements and that's great for what they've done. But I would imagine that there are students who weren't adequately prepared in high school but who have a great desire to want to be a nurse and want to be a doctor but they come underprepared due to the shortcomings of the DOE. Is there an opportunity for us to identify those students who have that love, that drive, that desire, and the potential, but it has not been manifested through their grades? What is the selection process? How does a student actually get into a nursing program? And are there opportunities if you don't get in at the beginning to get in somewhere down the line? other than at that entry point? Um, this varies from college to college, so I'm going to ask oh. my, uh, uh, President Rabb and President Keyes to comment on admissions and, and um, compensatory sort of a activities okay. that they might engage in. Um, this is a problem that we are Is your mic on? Um, uh, and uh, students who come in wanting to be nurses at York, there are five courses that they must take, and they must get uh, earn on that a 3.0 GPA, which is for some people a high benchmark. <coughs> However, because there are five specific courses, there is wrapped around those courses some tutorials embedded uh, within those courses. And so students then focus on that, take those courses, and through that pipeline get selected. But yes, it is a bit of a high benchmark because it is a 3.0. Uh, but there is uh, wraparound support. Uh, the other thing I do want to say with regard to this is that um, there are also students with special needs. Those students identify, if they identify and they must, uh, we, we, we can't assume they need it, we can't predict they need it, we can't think they need it. If they identify, they will get the needed accommodations. Those students who may have cognitive disabilities, et cetera, should they identify through the Office of Disabilities, they will get the needed support in order to um, prepare themselves for, uh, for entry. Now, as for those who don't get in, uh, we at York have, and this is a very tough thing, believe you me, because students who come in wanting to be nurses, it's very difficult to say, well, why don't, try, why don't you try something else? It's very, very difficult. But we do have some other avenues where we work with students through advisement in order to keep them, if we can, within the healthcare field. And um, so we work through advisement in those areas. But capacity is an issue for us, and the high GPA is a bit of an issue, but we do try to provide the tutorials in order to help students in. Uh, Dr. But I would, I think it's very similar situations. I think that's one of the reasons, uh, Chair Barron, that we all focus on these pipeline programs from the community colleges because that is a place where the students can really get the support, get their RNs, and then move on to the senior colleges. But again, we also, we're all trying to do the outreach to recruit and support the students. But there's, there's a really is a capacity issue as well because um, we're looking at a, a professional school where the, the, the cost of the education is very intense. Um, I think it's been mentioned in some of the literature, we need to place our students. And so there's challenges on getting placements for the students. And then there's challenges in recruiting and growing a faculty. 
So we're all, I know we've, we've grown our, our program over the years and we continue to commit to small percentage growth every year because of the need for nurses. Um, but that the, the, the gateway is a, is a serious one and there's, we try to support the students to get to that gateway, but we also then try to talk to them about other options in their profession. So we, are, we have just added a bachelor's in social work, which for students who wanted to help, you know, be part of a caring and a support is also an attractive uh, alternative. We have community urban public health as an undergraduate major. So I think we're doing all the different things from supporting students who want to get into the career to providing alternatives to thinking about ways we can grow the undergraduate population. And there's a lot of challenges coming on different fronts. I, I should also add that we do work with the Department of Education and, and with the high schools. Um, so we have College Now courses um, in every borough that are um, connected to or, or cater to students who might have an interest in, in, in health education. So some examples of courses we've offered through College Now, and College Now, of course, as you know, is gives college credit to high school students for courses they take while they're high school students uh, under our auspices. And ex some recent coursework, uh, Introductory Nutrition at LaGuardia Community College, Principles of Epidemiology at Hunter, uh, Environmental Health Issues at Medgar Evers, and Introduction to Human Services and Social Work at BMCC. Plus we have an, uh, an early college school, a CUNY early college school um, called the Hero High School located in the South Bronx, and it has a focus on nursing and health careers. So from grades nine to 14, students prepare for a career as a registered nurse or community health worker, and they can earn an associate degree from Hostos Community College after they complete high school and participate in internships at Montefiore Medical Center and other clinical sites. And uh, about 150 students have graduated from this new high school so far and all, nearly all are pursuing a college degree. So we do try to help at the front end build a, a pipeline or a ladder uh, through uh, curriculum and through early college high school um, to these professions. Um, granted, we can do more um, and uh, we would like to do more, but uh, these things take time and, and money. So is it the same five courses that have to be met? Hunter, you have the same five courses? No, I think we are now at, I think we have three courses that, we, we went to, because of this problem, we used, to have an, we used to do require more courses and admit in the junior year. And, and about five years ago, we made the admission in sophomore year, we had fewer courses. We also have an entrance exam. So it's, it's, it's very rigorous, I mean, I, I often think that people in, don't ac always comprehend how deeply rigorous the training is to be a nurse mm -hmm. and the qualifications. And I just have enormous respect for people committed to this profession. But it is a very challenging entrance. And um, you know, again, I think we all want to do more to make sure more people are prepared. But there will be. It is one of those professions I think where people, more people will aspire to enter then we'll, <laughs> then, then, then we'll bail out. And that's why I think many of us have focused on other uh, options if this is a passion. So I think Dr. Bowers mentioned nutrition. We've been growing our undergraduate nutrition program, a wonderful career in health. We've sent people to dietetic internships in hospitals. So we, we try to find people's passion and help mm -hmm. them find career tracks in the healthcare industry or the, the health in, in the support industry that are satisfying as well. So with the required courses um, that have to receive a, th that we have to achieve a 3.0. It's probably yeah. different than the Yeah, high yeah and for us, we, we're just so ranking. Yeah. So people, students, they take the courses, they take the entrance, yeah. and they, the, our faculty looks at a composite portfolio. So we're looking at, and then we're looking at our own students, and then we have people transferring in every year to take those classes again and to take that exam. So the demand, is really extraordinary. As I said, we've been growing in small, as we can increase our capacity, but it's a deep demand. So in, in both of your schools where you're, you have your nursing programs, if a student doesn't reach a particular benchmark, are they out? We work, they're not out, we work very hard to make sure they're not out of Hunter, but if they're, they may not be accepted to be a nurse. 
And that's what I'm saying. We have in, I've invested significant resources for counseling those students. So that's where we're going to say if maybe you'll try again, but at some point if this isn't going to work, would you think about nutrition? Would so they may have an opportunity so, to. So, so, and so we, we, our goal is to keep that student at Hunter College and to graduate them with their bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And, and one thing I did mention before also is another, we have this accelerated program now. So again, you may be able to improve your science scores and come back and try for the accelerated program. We want that student who started at Hunter College or transferred to Hunter College, if they are not fortunate enough to realize their dream to get into the nursing program, we want them to stay, mm -hmm. to graduate, and to have a career path. And that's why, as I said, we've worked hard to provide ways to respond to that passion with a, with a career path that's viable for them. Thank you. Um, I have lots of questions, but my colleagues have been very patient, so I'm going to uh, ask. Council Member Rodriguez has questions, and then I'll come back, and we'll get other questions, and I'll come back again. Thank you, Chair. Look, as we are getting close to celebrate Martin Luther King legacy, it's difficult to swallow how we as a city can be comfortable on how we are doing building the pipeline of a student that should be entry, having all the opportunity to be in the whole field. Like that field is so exclusive, not because we couldn't build the pipeline, but yet because people justify that we can go to sleep in peace. Like it's a Disney, it's a magical word. It's like things will happen overnight and it's all about when students take classes, they you know, are able to get into middle school without being as strong in science and math, not because they didn't have the capacity, but yeah, because we didn't invest, because we don't care. Because it's like the opium crisis, unless it affects people directly. Like, we're comfortable with what we have. And I think that, you know, my wife always told me that we as a human being get to justify in our brain that we have to live with what we have. And there's always a reason why someone kill another person because it was a matter, it's an instant to survive. And here we have in the city that still in 2019, we can live with those numbers. They don't make sense. They don't make sense at all. Like still like 6% of the students going to our New York City public school, they don't have a brother and sister who was a doctor, who was an engineer. Like those kids, they are not strong in math and science. So here we are, you know, still working with that population that they would be doing good regardless. Are we investing, and this is not just CUNY, it's not about Hunter, it's not about City, it's not about Hostel. Like those, normally we say 125 kids being able to make it. For how many years? How many students went through years after years and not being able to say, this is like a strong plan. There's a lot of science program going on in the Natural History Museum and other places. And that's where the pipeline started. But you know, take advantage, those kids who live in the surrounding area. So, unless we as a city build the pipeline, guys, and you are all there at challenges. I used to be a teacher for 13 years. And in two weeks, three weeks, I, work, I got someone who was a 98 average student. He would make me look good because he came in strong already. My challenge was those who were 80, those who were 65. City College is something amazing, like which was, you know, we were denying the past a student whose average was from 85 to 92 to enter the senior college. And they did a pylon, a, 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 a a pilot project, and they decided to choose some students who were never traditional sector. 
And I say not because I have additional information because some of the students that used to be part of Peron High School, they were, they have accents, probably have a stronger accent than them. And they were not doing good in the SAT. When the city college gave them the opportunity, most of them graduated with three point average. Yes, it's tough to get into those science programs, into the medical school, but we had to lower a little bit the entry. Because the way of how the program is structured right now will not allow for us to grow. And we will continue walking into the emergency room in our hospital, and most of the doctors, they will not look how New York City is. 29% Latino, 27% black, more than 10 Asian. So, few things that I believe is important to look at this is one, one for me, one is when it came to the CUNY School of Medicine, how, how can we advocate for them to have all the financial support? I was a political science major. We know that the cost to be a political science major is not the same as to be a doctor, as to go to medical school. So for me, it's a few things that is, one is the challenges about the cost of those students. Share those numbers with us so that we can go and lobby there at the state level. And it's the same thing at the school of engineering or the field. And the second piece is about diversity on the staff. I'm not, I think it's a good number, I'm not happy with that number, and especially the number turned to be lower as we go higher. So for me to, you know, the great president, you know, my former, my great president, my former professor, City College, I had those two questions, I mean, especially to, to, the, to the, the CUNY School of Medicine. One, the cost, what are the challenges that we have? Second, capacity. And third, about our leadership of the staff. And how can we change the program so that the student who started in City College in bio or science, they also should be able to transfer to the school, to the CUNY School of Medicine, because unless things change in the Sophie David, the student had to go be going directly. There wasn't an opportunity for a student who started in the bio or science to be able to say, I can transfer to the School of Medicine. A couple of answers to that. Um, let me start with, the, well, start with the finance question. We do have issues uh, at, at the School of Medicine. And, and, and when the school was founded, it was founded on the expectation that we would get more or less the same deal that the SUNY medical schools got. Now, SUNY medical schools, uh, when they were founded or when they were established during the Pataki administration, he had a policy called a capitation policy. So dollar for dollar, what students paid in tuition was matched by the state. And you know those numbers, to th th that policy ended towards the end of his uh, uh, administration, but the money was baselined into the into the budget. So there was an expectation when the, the CUNY School of Medicine was funded, founded that we would have something similar to that. And the projection was that we would get something like $11.2 million for the state. And that's, that's roughly, uh, you know, dollar for dollar tuition that the students have paid. That money has never um, come through. So in, in the first couple of years of the medical school, when we're teaching what they call the didactic courses, where it's essentially a classroom course, the school is doing quite well. Um, in fact, it, 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 it takes in a little bit more tuition than it costs to run the program. We're now getting into the areas where the students are doing their clinical rotation. And so, you know, there are cadaver programs, they're working in the hospitals. Um, we are, as I, as I said, um, paying the instructional costs of, of faculty associated with the hospitals. And so all of a sudden, instruction gets more expensive. So w we are 
you know, tirelessly advocating for the agreement that's never, it's never quite been repudiated. It just hasn't been acted on. And I will say that CUNY has been, uh, you know, exceptionally supportive of this. It's one of the lead items in our budget request this year. But this is a real serious issue for us, that, you know, medical education is expensive education. The, the average cost uh, or the budget of the SUNY medical schools is between 30 and $40 million. The state budget for the CUNY School of Medicine is $11 million. And so we think there's a real argument to be made about fiscal equity, particularly in light of the, the commitment of the school to primary health care education and to diversifying the medical profession. So that, that's the first answer. The answer, I mean, the question, Councilman, that you asked about the opportunity of people to come into the program. The program is structured in such a way that our first years don't overlay a traditional medical school. And so it's almost like if you don't, if you don't get the didactic courses that in most medical school you would get in third and fourth year, we teach them in the third and fourth year of the undergraduate course. So we have a robust pre-med program that comes out of biology in psychology. So, so probably there are as many city college graduates getting into medical school as are in the CUNY School of Medicine but they're not going to graduate from the CUNY School of Medicine. And this, this has something to do with, as I say, the, the way the curriculum is structured. It's also a capacity issue. I think if we're able to solve the budget issue, we would be able to think about opening up uh, a way into the CUNY School of Medicine for a second year, a third year, a fourth year student. Um, as things stand right now, we take in, we admit about 7% of the students that apply for us. So we, we get about a thousand applications. The annual class is, is 70 students. But w one of the things that I think we're really proud of is unlike a lot of medical schools, we don't have kind of a quantitative algorithmic based admission process. It's a very qualitative process. So every student is, is interviewed. Students, faculty sit down with every single candidate that makes the initial cut. And one of the big criteria is are you committed to the social mission of the CUNY School of Medicine? So I don't think, you know, when you say we're accepting 7% of the, uh, of the students, you know, uh, it's not the top 7% GPA, it's not the top 7% SAT, it's 7% that's culled from the entire list of, 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 of applicants. And I think that, that that's reflected in our, in our diversity numbers. That said, we have a thousand students that apply to the school every year. And if we had the capacity to educate them all the way through, we would embrace that mission with, with, with enthusiasm. I think those were the three questions. Did I miss something? Uh, what percentage Virtually all of them. Virtually all of them, yeah. Yeah, we have very few that apply from outside uh, the, the city. 26% 20, come from the area within five miles of, of, of City College campus. Yeah, I'll have to go back to the to, to the college and get it, but I'll, if, if I can, I'll send it on. My last question was about my last question was about staff leadership, yep. you, on and how are we doing at the top level? Yeah. Even though you show the twelve percent at the low or the Yeah, you know, so twenty five percent of our deans, and th there are a lot of deans in the School of Medicine, are are from underrepresented um, communities. I don't want to say, I don't want to say that it's all about budget. But budget is an important element of this. So we just made a retention offer to somebody where we, we offered them $45,000 above the salary they'd been making because they'd gotten a matching offer from a medical school for $90,000 above our current salary. And, and, and this person decided to stay. She's a woman of color. We're really proud of that retention effort. Um, but we are virtually every year faced with members of our medical faculty who come with $100,000 raise offers from competing institutions. The first answer. The second answer is you look at the, you look at the, um, 
you look at the, the medical school numbers nationwide, 6%, 7%, that really speaks to the pipeline that you're talking about. I think our best chance at, at the CUNY School of Medicine is to, is to be talking to the students that are going through our medical school early on about not just careers in primary health care, but careers in teaching. Four of the faculty members of color that are currently teaching at the CUNY School of Medicine are City College graduates, and they come back to the, to the medical school to teach at lower salaries because they're committed to the mission. So I think we have, we have a, a mission not just to educate primary health care doctors, but also to educate people that are going to come back and teach. The economic reality of a place like City College is the many, many, and, and Hunter and York and all the CUNY schools, is your core faculty, our faculty that are there not just to draw a paycheck, but they're there because they're committed to the mission. And, and we've got to build that into the construction of our, of our pipeline. And as I said earlier, nobody's happy with, with, with our figures. Uh, you know, the, the, the national figures of diversity in medical schools are a disgrace. We are above that, but we're not sufficiently above that, and we're going to work on that every year. I have to excuse myself. Yes, Baron. I was yes. told that you would and have to leave. The, the presidents will stay. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, just before I ask Councilmember Holden to pose his questions, as we're talking about the finances a little bit, yeah. just have a couple of questions. In your testimony, you said you have an affiliation agreement between the medical school and the clinical partners. Yeah. And another sentence says, this affiliation model presents the greatest degree of separation between the medical school and the hospital right. and the least amount of risk and financial liability to our parent institution. Mm -hmm. So I'd like for you to talk about that. But then I did hear you also say the instructional costs of the faculty at the hospital are borne by CUNY. And then the third part is um, when CUNY's announcement about the CUNY School of Medicine was made, it said that there was a campaign underway to raise $20 million in interest-free loans for the inaugural BSND class. So I want to know what's the status, um, what is that $20 million going to cover, and what are the conditions under which a student would have to present to qualify for that uh, loan? Okay. Um, let me start with the instructional costs. Uh, you know, medical schools are, are, are risky endeavors for universities, and that's because most of them, or many of them, when they build a medical school, they build a hospital. And so that means that the university takes on the financial liability of a hospital. If it's, if it's doing well, that's great, but many of them don't. And, and, and so in setting up our school, rather than building or managing or operating a hospital with all the risks uh, associated with that, we uh, uh, entered into a relationship with St. Barnabas Hospital. Okay. And so in third and fourth year medical students who are doing their clinical work uh, are educated there. The <coughs> and the combined annual costs that we pay for those instructions, and it comes in a number of different uh, buckets, is roughly $2 million a year. So these are expenses that we did not have in the first two years. And now that we're in the third year of medical school, those expenses come, come on board. Uh, so on the one hand, that is a, a risk mitigating strategy because we don't mm. necessarily need to be concerned about the financial health of St. Barnabas, um, but it means we have a fixed cost to pay right. a, 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 every single year. Um, sorry, your second question was? Um, so the instructional, the instructional staff yeah. at the hospital is paid by? Is paid by City College, City by College. the CUNY School of Medicine. So that's, as I say, about $2 million a year. Okay. And then the third question was about the uh, $20 million interest-free loans that you wanted to establish. Yeah. Uh, what's the status? Uh, what will that $20 million cover? Can any of the students apply? And is this just a one-time endeavor, or do you think that this will be something that will be recurring? So as you know, I came on as president two years ago, and, and, and so I um, came into a situation where I was discovering um, a number of kind of foundational agreements for the, the CUNY School of Medicine. The original 
the original feasibility study that we had established for the School of Medicine actually said we needed about $100 million in, in scholarships. Um, when I, and and there, are, there are documents that revise that number down to, to $20 million, and in fact, there was virtually no, no progress towards that goal in philanthropy. One of the problems that we're running into, and so we had to start that operation from scratch two years ago. In fact, we hired the fundraiser who would be responsible for that a year, uh, a year ago. Um, and it was, it was one of the areas when I came into this position where I thought our, our progress against a goal was nowhere near where it, where it needed to be. So this is a real focus of, of our efforts to develop philanthropic momentum. Frankly, one of the challenges is we have 45 years of graduates of the Sophie Davis School of Medicine who don't think that they're part of the CUNY School of Medicine. And so, so getting them to associate the, the, the debt that they feel towards City College to this new endeavor rather than the old endeavor. We just got a million dollar gift uh, three weeks ago from a graduate of Sophie Davis. And he explicitly said, I want this to go for scholarships to Sophie Davis students rather than CUNY School of Medicine students. So this is, a, this is something we really have to work on. As far as eligibility requirements for the scholarships, you know, typically donors will, will set their own eligibility requirements, but in our vision, um, virtually everyone who goes to the School of Medicine should have some scholarship to mitigate what is in fact a fairly expensive tuition. The students pay $40,000 a year once they enter the medical school portion, and that compares favorably with the sco SUNY schools, but to reach the students that we want to give medical education to, they're going to need scholarship support. So the $20 million will be designated um, by the person who's making the contribution, or does it go into a general pot and then the school will distribute it? It'll all depend on the, agree on the agreement with the donor. Oh so some donors okay. will say, I, want, I would like to give this scholarship for specific purposes. Some will be general purpose, and okay. I think we'll use the general purpose funds to even out the gaps in, in, in whatever the specific allocations are. But this is something I'm going to be working on very intensively. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to hear next from Councilmember Kalos. I want to thank our uh, chair, uh, Varen, for her strong questioning and opening statement and amazing uh, quotes uh, that opened this. I, I just had a very important question for uh, Vice Chancellor Jane Bowers. I'm concerned that the Chancellor isn't here. I'm concerned that the Vice Chancellor didn't see fit to stay. So my question to the, ch is there somebody from intergovernmental here taking notes for the Vice Chancellor? Okay, so and my, my just so that you know, Council Member, I was told at the outset that she was on a tight schedule and would have to leave. So just so that you know, I, I, I appreciate it. Just CUNY mm -hmm. always stays. This is the first time okay. that a CUNY pa no, I, so I, that I a CUNY panelist has had to leave. So my, my I just question is to say the Vice Chancellor, and um, I'm sure there's somebody here who's going to take the question. Sure, my my, my okay. question is just, uh, can you educate more students? low-income students of color to enter nursing professions and healthcare with a hole in the ground? Can you educate the people there, or can you do it better by actually building the school that was intended to educate those students that was planned five years ago? So my question to the Vice Chancellor is just, can you educate more people with a hole in the ground or a nursing school? That is it. Okay. We will make sure that they get that question and expect an answer to that. Thank you. And we will make sure we, we relay the answer so that you'll know. Okay, Councilmember Holden. Yes, I, I too had a, a, a few questions to the Vice Chancellor. So John, maybe you can answer. <laughs> um, the, there's a search for the University Dean of Health and Human Services. Do we know how long that search has been going on and um, how long the position, is, is it vacant, the position now? Yes. It is? Okay. How long has it been vacant? Uh, if we're going to have to ask you to come to the panel in the council. Sorry, will sorry John. <laughs> He's prepared. He knows. Okay. And John, if, uh, Mr. Kodowski, if you would uh, submit to oath. Okay. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Thank you. Please, Please give state us your name. name for the record. Oh. Oh, you have to be uh, video. We want to see your face as oh. well. <laughs> now you're in trouble. 
your name and your name and testimony. John Katowski, City Relations Director for Central Office. Yeah, so the, the question about the um, how long has the position of Dean of Health and Human Services been vacant and when do we expect to finish the search? Okay, the uh, prior dean was Bill Levenstein, uh, who had been the dean for sciences for quite a number of years. Uh, he stepped down, and he his other role was the John F. Kennedy Institute, which he went back to. So this has been vacant for about, I'll say, eight months, six to eight months. And I, I'm not sure, uh, Councilman, whether or not they've started the search. That I'll find out for you. Because um, I, I, I agree with Dr. Rab about um, the associate degrees in nursing. I think we need ba more bachelor's degrees. Um, uh, and that's really probably true in most fields th these days, that we need bac baccalaureates or advanced degrees. I'm just wondering, uh, and again, this I don't know if, John, you can answer this, but why don't we have more advanced degrees in the health areas, uh, especially city tech, which led the way for so many years. Um, I, I taught at City Tech for a long time, and our nursing was, uh, you know, department was great. In mo most of the area, dental hygiene, uh, dental lab, uh, like I said, nursing, radiology, uh, vision care. We, these are all very, very important areas of health care, and yet many of them are either associates or, or, or bachelors or not even. So what I, why don't we have a master's degree? Uh, I think the president's in their testimony kind of alluded to that. It's resources, it's capacity, it's, you know, it's the ability to bring them on and move them through. Uh, the, the health science programs, and you were at tech for a long time, so you know, uh, it's limited in space and it's limited in resources. I think uh, Councilman Kalos uh, was alluding to the school that Hunter College is trying to form over uh, with, uh, with Sloan Kettering. Um, finances for this have not been forthcoming from, uh, from, you know, from the state or, uh, you know, from any other source. So, you know, I think the colleges are trying to build its resources that have kind of hogtied them. But that's always, that's, I, I was at CUNY for 40 years. And it's never been a good budget. We never had a great budget. Uh, we, you know, we, we expanded at City Tech, um, but I'm just wondering why everything is lagging behind. And it's, if it's only about budget, maybe we really have to uh, get more vocal with this because associate degrees don't cut it, I think, today. J John, may, may I? Go ahead, something? please. Yeah. I, I think it raises a very good point, but I think it's the, oh, I'm sorry. the the accreditors often um, influence what the degree level will be. And one of the things I think the beauties of a CUNY is that you do have the associate level degrees where that is the appropriate and the terminal degree. So the dental hygienist or the certain radiologist, mm -hmm. and we're growing those programs. The accreditors have, and Dr. Gee and I both experienced this, been pressuring elevation of many of the degrees. So physical therapy, for example, it used to be a master's, and the accreditor determined it would be a doctorate, and we all had to revamp. Um, but the, so I think most of us within our purviews are looking at what the appropriate programs are, and actually are very committed to growing them. And are I think you, you as Dr. Key said, I think you're going to see in the next few years more programs where appropriate. And I know I'm doing I'm my best to grow our programs. So our physical therapy, speech pathology the applications are just skyrocketing for programs that need space, resources, et cetera. But we're, we're making plans to grow them and I think also opportunistically looking at degrees. I think both of us have had a conversation for many years about whether there should be a pharmacy degree at CUNY. And we both think it should be at our college. <laughs> but we're friends, so that's okay. But you, um, have, you but so you have articulation agreements with all the CUNY uh, schools, uh, uh, Hunter so yeah, and Hunter I and. Oh, we're as appropriate. That's right. And I think, but I do think the so some of these degrees where the nursing is a particular crisis because here's a, this is a field where the employers have really determined that a degree that we're giving is not the degree that they want to hire from. And I feel, and been very vocal within CUNY, that we have to make this commitment at the senior colleges from both of us that we really must provide the degree that the employer is looking for. So it will be in 10 years, 
the number of associate level nurses is being hired is declining. Right. And we really need to do that. Whereas some associate level degrees, as I said, are perfect, that is the right degree and there will be a seamless hiring. The medical lab science program I spoke of, that's a bachelor, that's actually a BA degree. Every time we graduate a student with that degree, one of the hospitals or a quest will hire that student. It's a complete growth area. So we are systematically and strategically growing that. So I think most of the presidents are really very interested because we know our students will get, to, will get jobs with these degrees. But the, the nursing associates is a particular dislocation that CUNY as an institution is addressing, and I think we'll, we're all committed to continue to Yeah, I want to shout out to Hunter, by the way. Uh, my, I got my MFA from Hunter. Uh, great, great college, and um, they all are, by the way, uh, Queens College. Anybody here from Queens College? No? No, oh, there you go. Great, shout out. Um, that was at my bachelor's, but um, Hunter was terrific. I, I knew Margaret Magnus, Dr. Margaret Magnus, uh, who was in the nursing, led the nursing yes, department. Yes. Uh, she Wonderful. passed, but yeah, she was she was, she was a good friend of mine. Legend, and yeah. That's would right. always talk about the nursing and Hunter, and that's why I actually um, I enrolled at Hunter because of Margaret Magnus, oh, not in nursing, but in art, <laughs> because she said it was a great college, and, and, and it is. So thank you, Dr. R thank you all for your wonderful well, testimony. Please come visit our, our new I art studios on, right on Tribeca. I'd love to so go back to there. Right. I haven't been back in years, but I'd love Great. to go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, President Boudreaux, I just have, I guess, one or two more questions. So as, as the school is continuing to meet its uh, goals and have the first graduating class in 2020, you're going to need additional faculty. You're going to need additional. How are you, where are you on that path to getting the additional faculty? How many people are we talking about? And is that the same type of faculty that will be now at the hospital when the students begin yeah. the work there? Yeah, no, the, so the, the, the faculty at the hospital are employees of the hospital. So okay. we're essentially subcontracting. It's a partnership <laughs> agreement, and, and, and so that's, a, that's an entirely different faculty. Every year, in the, when we had the first year of medical students, we were hiring faculty to teach the second year, and, right. and so now we have the right. third year, we're hiring the fourth year. Um, I, I have to say, I'll have to get you the numbers on, on how many we're hiring every year. I will say it is the only place we're hiring at City College now is in the medical school. So it's, it's, it's both faculty, it's, it's lab technicians, it's people guiding, doing the research. It's, it, so I, I, I will say that I see about 20 hires I did last year, and, and I, I probably, if I can remember, I've signed papers for about 12 additional people so far this year. That should start to wind down next year, but w my guess is, and I'll follow up with, with, with hard data, is it w it's about 20 people a year. And did I, did I recall you accurately saying, uh, is my recollection accurate, that you have students who are sitting on these selections? Could you just talk about that briefly? So we have- Because I'm always very concerned about the old boy network mm -hmm. that sort of blocks people of color, blacks, from getting in yeah. and breaking through that because they're not a part of that closed system. Yeah, and I, th and I think that's a legitimate concern. I think, you know, when we went from the Sophie Davis School, which was still an undergraduate program, and, and, and the medical right. professors that taught were typically from other places that would come in, all of a sudden we had to be the medical school. And I think in the initial round of hiring, people were so concerned to get the technical expertise that they weren't concerned about the, 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 you know, they weren't concerned that, that the faculty be as, as representative as it needs to be. Last year, or maybe it was in the spring of 2016, there was a, there was a little incident on campus between um, students of color and a couple of students who weren't. Uh, and it, it, at a moment when the school was moving from Sophie Davis to the medical school, it, it, it gave us a moment to kind of do some soul searching and think about what we needed to do and what we needed to be. At that time, some of the courses in the old Sophie Davis program that were about cultural sensitivity and the needs of the community and how do you empathize with patients, they had been taken out of the curriculum and that had been brought back in. Students were concerned that they didn't have a voice in faculty hiring, and so in consequence of that, they were brought into um, the hiring process. And this year's uh, crop of, of faculty hires are more diverse in consequence of that. 
And there were some other innovations that came out as, as, as a consequence of that. We had brought a team of, of, of medical school professionals from various colleges, three men and women of color to come in and do an audit of how we were approaching these issues. But one of the real tangible results of that was the presence of students on, on the faculty hiring process. And I think it's been a really good thing for the school. Perhaps we can get CUNY to put some students on the uh, search committee for a chancellor and uh, get some movement with getting that process completed. That would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do we have students on the search committee? We do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Of course, we always want to get into the data, and we'll send the questions to uh, CUNY we always want to know uh, disaggregated information in terms of the healthcare degree program at CUNY, in terms of the number of students uh, by age, gender, high school, residency, race, ethnicity, uh, for each of the programs, the nursing program, physician's assistance program. We did already talk about the supports to students in these programs. Uh, you did mention the retention rate for the uh, School of Medicine? You said you want, uh, how is, what is that retention rate? I don't recall. Well, so Have you lost any students? So from far, the School of Medicine? We, we've lost less than 5% of the students. We don't, now, we, I, I will say this, they're going into the most challenging part of their medical education right now. So we bring in 70 students. I think our senior class now has 67 students in it. So we lost three in that. It, it, it's not bad, we'd like it to be better. Do we know what happened to that student? Was it a matter of academics, or were there other social issues that, or finance issues? Do we have a way of knowing I, why I, that student left? I don't Those know specifically. Left? I know that the students are in the biology department pursuing a kind of standard pre-med So degree. they moved to another They moved to another science program. Science area, okay. And, um, so we know that NYU <laughs> came into a big pot of money, and they announced that the tuition charges would be fully subsidized for its students going forward because they want to encourage students to uh, work in underserved locations and primary care fields. How can CUNY reconcile its desire for its graduates to provide primary care uh, with the MD tuition program, the MD tuition program at the, at the level that it is? I, th I, th I think it's a tough reconciliation, to be perfectly honest with you. I, th I think our medical school is, is less than the SUNY medical schools. I think the, the, you know, the campaign to raise philanthropic monies to defray the cost of education needs to be a real priority for the school, and, and I'm, I'm disappointed that it wasn't you know, well underway when we named the school. I, th I, I think to launch a campaign after you name a school is, is, is an awkward set of sequences. Um, however, I think that, you know, if you, th if you think about what the school needs, it, it needs those tuition dollars to run, but, it would, but our goal should be that those tuition dollars shouldn't come out of the students' pockets. And so a philanthropic campaign that, that fully funded scholarships for students is a distant goal, but I think it's something we have to keep working on. <coughs> um, it, 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 it's not a satisfactory answer at this moment, I think, but uh, you know, making fundraising for the School of Medicine a priority on campus, and a campus that really has tremendous philanthropic potential, um, has to be at the top of the agenda. And f uh, I haven't talked to you directly, but my, my goal is to return CUNY to be tuition free as it was when I attended, which was the reason that I could attend. Um, do you have any further questions? Okay, I want to thank the panel. The other data that we need we'll put in writing and send to you. But I want to thank you for your presentation very much. Thank, thank you for thank this you. opportunity. And we'll next have uh, Joe Wiedemann, Wiedehorn, who is from the American Associated Medical Society, no, 
Associated Medical Schools of New York. Welcome, if you would raise your right, no, you don't. Thank you, if you would just give us your name and you can begin your testimony, thank you. When you see the red light, it's on. I hope my testimony goes better than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my name is Joe Wiederhorn. I'm the president and CEO of the Associated Medical Schools of New York. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present in front of you uh, today. Um, the Associated Medical Schools of New York represents New York State's 16 medical schools. We train more students than any other state in the country. We have more medical schools than any other state in the country. And we train more physician residents than any other state in the country. So medical education and medical school is truly a big business in New York State. We have eight medical schools within the five boroughs of New York. That is a very high concentration of medical schools. And you'll see at the back, on the back of the testimony, there's a list of all of the medical schools that we have here. The CUNY College of Medicine, um, and previously when it was Sophie Davis, they were um, part, they are and were parts of our organization. Uh, we have been providing, we have been overseeing diversity programs in New York State since 1985. Uh, at that time, the science technology entry programs began in the state. Uh, we were instrumental in the development of them. And up until about three years ago, as an organization, we oversaw them at 10 medical schools within the state. Those programs are designed to get um, high school and now junior high school kids interested in going into, into science technology or entry at science technology programs. Um, at, um, uh, at the medical schools, they concentrated on getting junior high and high school kids interested in going into medicine. Um, about five years ago, the state education department changed its funding formula, and at that time, um, it became more advantageous for the schools to apply individually rather than for us to oversee them. Uh, more money that went directly to this programming that way, so we stepped back and let the schools do it uh, themselves. Currently, we oversee six diversity in medicine programs. Four of them are post-baccalaureate programs that are unique in that the student applies to the medical school. A medical school will refer them to um, uh, one of our four post-bac programs. And if the student successfully completes the, the program, the, st the school that referred him or her has to take them in their next year entering class. We've had one program at Buffalo since 1991 at, the, at SUNY Buffalo. We have over <coughs> 500 practicing physicians who've gone through that program. Uh, we have three other programs uh, around the state. Those programs are different in that they also provide master's degrees so that when the students complete the master's degree, um, when they complete the program, they have a master's plus they have an automatic entry into medical school. Um, those programs are also <coughs> very successful. Um, and what we do for those programs is we provide stipends to the students uh, at the Buffalo program in particular, the students are not allowed to work um, because it, uh, when the program was originally developed, it was seen to be um, necessary for kids to really concentrate on their studies as opposed to having to go out and work since many students couldn't quite make the academic um, requirements because of their need to work when they were in undergraduate school. 
Uh, so we provide stipends for the students. And in Buffalo, the school provides free tuition for the post bac program. At the other three programs, because they offer master's degrees, the students um, pay tuition, but um, we provide stipends for them, which can either go to paying down their school loans or for um, uh, what they need for daily living. Uh, these programs also very successful programs. Unfortunately, they have been uh, supported by the state Department of, of Health, and over the course of the years, they have been the funding has been cut. Two years ago, we got a 22 and a half percent cut from the state, which uh, made us cut the number of students in the program. We decided to cut the students because we. It was either cutting the students or cutting the students' stipends, and we felt if we cut the students' stipends, uh, they really wouldn't have enough money to live on, and then they'd have to work, and so the purpose of the whole program uh, would go down the drain. Now, these programs from the very beginning uh, were um, developed in order to increase the pipeline of underrepresented students um, in medical school so that um, if the student applies to one of our medical schools and is put on a wait list for a, a different medical school, if the student gets taken off of that wait list, they cannot go to one of our programs and somebody else will go to one of our programs because again, the intent was to increase the pipeline um, for students who otherwise would not have gotten into medical school. So those are four of the six programs. Our other two programs are at uh, CUNY College of Medicine one and the other one is at CCNY. I'll get back to those in a minute because we also just started a new program for students who've gone through one of our four post back programs. We have received funding from the state for full scholarships for these students uh, and they're pegged to SUNY tuition. So we have money for 10 students uh, a year to get a full scholarship and in return, they uh, need to, they have an obligation to work in an underserved area in New York State uh, for uh, anywhere between two and four years, depending on how many years they get the scholarship. So the first year they get the scholarship, they make a commitment for two years, and then it's an additional year after that. Uh, we are currently, we just got the budget from the governor yesterday. We were zeroed out as we were the year before for that program, but um, that has always been an assembly add-on, so we're going back uh, to see if we can get the assembly to put money back into that program. In terms of our programs with CUNY, um, we have two. One is the program that the president was talking about. We have a learning resource center at the CUNY College of Medicine, and what we do is we support that center um, we provide um, uh, skills, wait, I wrote it down just, sorry. Uh, academic counseling, coaching, mentoring. There's a pre-matriculation workshop that we support, uh, problem-based learning skills workshop. Uh, they do, the school does academic in evaluation and they provide interventions for at-risk students. Um, we find this is really necessary because the students, as the president said, go directly from high school into a medical school curriculum. And as students from our post back programs have said, you know, once you get into medical school, it's like a uh, fire hydrant has opened up and everything comes just whooshing right at you and you, you're just like overwhelmed by the amount of work that needs to get done. So um, the intent of the Learning Resource Center is to help the students get through that period. Uh, we've been funding that program for about 20 years now. Uh, we have um, a couple of hundred visits a year to the Learning Resource Center um, that we support. At CCNY, we have a very innovative program um, where we fund students, um, we give them stipends, and they are paired up with NIH or NSF funded researchers. And the intent of that program 
is to increase the uh, number of underrepresented students who are interested in going into basic science research. Um, that program also has been very successful and there are a number of charts and graphs at the back of my written testimony. Um, but um, one, of the, one of the most interesting things is that between 2008 and 2018, we've been able to track 69 students. Of those, 37% of them went on to, to go to medical school. 49% of them went on to go into the biomedical sciences, MD, PhD, I'm sorry, not an MD, PhD, master's degree, uh, some further education within the biomedical sciences, and 14% went into other health professions. So it's a really a very successful program. We used to um, fund uh, 30 students a year with our cuts in, the D in our Department of Health funding. Uh, we now only fund 10. Last year we had a little extra money so we were able to fund 13 students. It's a drastic cut from what we used to do at the height of the program. We also used to provide a, uh, a little bit of um, money for their mentors and what the mentors did was they used this money to help supply their lab and uh, for teaching purposes, mentoring purposes, that sort of thing. Uh, we really feel that our programs at CUNY, which also at the medical school, which we also had to cut with our cut in uh, funding from DOH, we really feel that those are important programs. They have extremely high success rates. And I, I have only one copy, but I will be glad to, give, to send to you the copies of uh, the success rates in all of our diversity in medicine programs. Our post-baccalaureate program, the one in Buffalo, the oldest one, 93% of the students who entered that program went on to medical school, and 85% of those actually graduated from medical school. And the important thing about those statistics is that, once again, these are students who otherwise would not have gone to medical school at all. And I can tell you a case history um, about one such student who went to the Buffalo program. Um, he came here, he didn't speak English, he came from Columbia. He is now the director of neurosurgery at um, uh, Cornell Weill Queens Hospital. And he says that you know one of the things that he finds the most enlightening is that most of his patients don't speak English. And so it's a really great for them to be able to come and talk to him and he can speak to them, relate to them, uh, and provide the types of services that uh, people need and should be getting. Um, so again, uh, one of the things that we are hoping we'll be able to do, uh, I've heard uh, quite a bit of talking about the cost of medical school. The average student leaves the average debt that a student leaves with is $191,000 after, after four years of medical school. Um, that's just the principal. If you look at the uh, interest that's accrued on top of that, it comes out to $250,000, $260,000. This precludes students from going into primary care. They have to get into specialties that will allow them to pay back these loans. So uh, one of the things that I think we could talk about if you're at all interested is taking the scholarship program that we now do for our students who go through our post back program and uh, you know, doing a pilot program with uh, CUNY Medical School, seeing if we can get some money to provide a couple of uh, scholarships and see how that works out for students who are in the medical school portion of that school. Uh, and the other thing that I think we should do because one of the major issues that is going on now is the lack of diversity within the biomedical research community. And therefore, there are a whole series and sets of diseases and conditions that are not being studied. And we have been trying to work uh, with a number of the institutions to see if we can increase the number of underrepresented students who go into biomedical research. And one of the things that we could do with CCNY is one, if we could get back to 
30 students within our program, that would be fantastic. I mean, that would be one thing that we could do. Um, we've also had some, they're not even really preliminary discussions, but we've, we've talked with the, the woman who runs that program at CCNY about maybe doing a post bac program for basic science researchers um, in conjunction with um, CCNY. So that's really, I have lots of statistics that I wrote down as you were uh, talking with President um, Boudreau about the percentage of students who are underrepresented. I have lots of state statistics which I sort of scribbled down, but I could give you, we do enrollment data every year from all of the schools in the state. We break it down by race, ethnicity, uh, gender. We also, besides the usual African American and Hispanic Latino, we break it down by uh, students who identify themselves as two or more races or ethnicities, so we have that breakdown as well. Um, and I'd be glad to provide you with any and all of that information. So that's my testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very enlightening, very interesting. So you started in 1985? Yes. What was the impetus for getting this started? Well, in at a, just around that time, the AAMC, the National Organization, was becoming increasingly aware of the disparity in terms of the number of underrepresented students um, going to medical school as opposed to white students. Uh, and they started a program called 3000 by 2000. And the intent of that program was to see if nationwide we could uh, get 3,000 students, underrepresented students, into medicine. And one of the things that we, if I can just step back, our organization has a committee on diversity and multicultural affairs, which is made up of the deans for diversity at all of our medical schools. So one of the things that um, they realized was that you just can't start trying to get students when they're in college and mm -hmm. say, oh, okay, mm -hmm. you need to right. um, apply to medical school and we'll help you. Uh, so uh, the woman who was at that time our in-office director of diversity worked with some of these deans and with um, Arthur Eves. He was oh, a, yes. an assemblyman yes. from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And um, actually Senator Laval, who is from Long mm -hmm. Island, and developed this, the STEP programs, the science technology entry program, so that we could start with high school students and then get high school students who were interested. And then in 1991, the same group of people applied to the federal government for our first post-baccalaureate program, realizing that you know a lot of the students who were coming up and were interested in going to medical school just didn't have the qualifications to get in, but the admissions committee said mm -hmm. all they need is a little academic right. enrichment. They need time away from their families so that they can concentrate on their studies. They need to know how they can best study. You know, mm -hmm. they need to be mentored. And, and so that was when uh, we put in a grant to the federal government and got our initial grant for our Buffalo post -Bac program. Mm. So we've been doing it a long time, and we have great success. We really have great success. Well, I'm so pleased to, to know now of your program. And the questions that I have are, what's the average uh, stipend or tuition assistance that you can give to students? In our post-bac program, we give um, $18,000 a year, which really is nothing if the students can't work. Um, you know. When it mm -hmm. started out and the, st and the students were in Buffalo, the cost of living in Buffalo wasn't that high. Now we like to tell everybody with the new Buffalo billion the mm. governor put in, <laughs> the cost of everything is yes. going up. So that's it's very difficult for students to survive on eight, $18,000 a year. That includes their health insurance, their books, mm, their rent, uh, everything. Mm. So, uh, And then for our scholarship program, it's $42,000 a year. Forty-two thousand, and it's pegged to SUNY tuition. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Do you find that, I see on the back of your testimony you have a list of, I think, what, 16 public and private medical schools, yes. and these are the ones that you are, that are part of your organization. Yes. Do you find that some are more involved than others? Because you keep referring to Buffalo, SUNY at Buffalo. Oh, I keep, that's because that's where our original program was. Okay. Um, but all of our schools are involved in one way or another in terms of our diversity programs. Not all of them send students to, to our post back program. Only 10 of them send students to the post back program. Some, you know, part of the issue that we have is that some schools it's very easy to attract upper uh, underrepresented students just because of their name. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the same issues of, well, this student is good, um, might need a little help, because they're just cherry picking off the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do with our programs is to let students who don't necessarily, and there are many students, you know, the number of students who go to Columbia or Cornell or NYU is minuscule compared to the number of students who go to the rest of our medical schools. So we're trying to get all the medical schools to be able to have a fair representation of underrepresented students. Thank you so much for coming and for sharing your testimony. And we'd be pleased to uh, receive the data that you've offered Absolutely. to send to us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank All the you. best. Are there any others who wish to give testimony? Seeing none, this hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>